What's up, everybody? This is Gray here, and welcome to the Sunday Shift Report. The crap has hit the fan. Anyways, folks, uh, I got a few things to go over with you today uh, in regards to uh, what's going on in the world, man. And uh, I am going to focus more so on uh, the crisis in America, per se, is the uh, energy and food crisis that we uh, are facing here in the U.S., uh, because uh, the majority of my audience is here, uh, nothing to deter against my folks that watch me that are in Canada, Australia, and everywhere else, because this will affect everyone in the world. Um, but I want to show you guys some statistics that uh, I'm not sure if you guys are aware of. Um, and we'll touch on a couple other things uh, overseas uh, that has been popping off, uh, you know, uh, and we'll reiterate some of the things that we discussed uh, last week, uh, which, uh, you know, if you guys have, if you guys are ever get lost or whatnot in my reports, there is a playlist of them. So you can see last week's or the weeks prior so that you can see how everything kind of culminates into what we're talking about in today. Um, I like to state this up front. Uh, and the reason I say this is because uh, everything in this in my videos are opinionated based on my opinion and the, and the material that I'm reading. Uh, that being said, most of you folks know that all the articles that I'll be going over, uh, plus then some, will be linked down below in the description so that you can read them for yourself. Uh, as well as draw your own conclusions. So that being said, I uh, truly appreciate every single one of you that are joining me on this premiere. Uh, I would love seeing you guys down in chat and mods. You guys, you know you guys rock. Uh, some of the best mods on YouTube, at least from my perspective. Uh, you guys are very hard workers, and I truly appreciate you guys. All right, so uh, moving on. Let's kind of dive into certain things here. Uh, like I said, I want to dive into some statistics. So let's look at some stuff here, folks. <clears throat> And maybe people don't understand this. And the reason I, I've been thinking about this is because I have conversations throughout the week with folks. And uh, when I bring up certain information, they get a little like puzzled. And they're like, really? And I'm like, yes, you have to look at the entire big picture to understand why things overseas affect us here in the U.S. So let's start with a few things. Let's start with the whole food issue, right? Um, if you guys haven't seen, things are critical. Uh, the supply chain is critical. The lockdown in China and them closing their ports are critical. There's a lot of bad things happening. Anyways, uh, and that being said, uh, I don't know if you guys saw uh, what's his name came out came out uh, uh, came out of hiding, but Fauci is back on the scene, and basically said that uh, the health crisis won't end until he says it ends. Uh, so now we have this whole uh, conflict overseas, as well as uh, Fauci making another appearance. So you guys know that things are not over yet, even though it seems like it. But if you guys saw, I think Australia is reversing course and enforcing more, uh, putting back their mandates. Austria is doing that, as well as several other countries. Just when we get a little, uh, a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, clearing, uh, it all comes back uh, tenfold, right? Anyways, we're not going to jump into that too much. Uh, I'm assuming the mainstream will bring it up soon enough. Anyways, here's what I want you guys to focus on. So, and I want to bring this up because some people have asked me about, well, what are the statistics? So let me bring up, first I want to start with fertilizer. And the reason I want to start with fertilizer is because this fertilizer and fuel are the biggest things for our farmers uh, outside of just growing the crops and the manpower and things like that. So let me bring up this little thing here, all right? Now, as you can see here, so this is production volume of nitrogen fertilizer worldwide in 2018 by country. Now, I couldn't find anything new. I couldn't find it 2019, 2020. Who knows why? I, I looked around, but I couldn't find it. But I want you to pay close attention to this because, like I said, Russia is a key player in this, uh, as well as the Ukraine. Come to find out, Ukraine also exports fertilizer as well as other things. But look, I want you guys to look at who is the number one right now for uh, nitrogen fertilizer worldwide by country. As you can see, who's the top dog? That is China. Uh, and then you got us, the United States, uh, almost, I don't know, less than half of production, uh, and which won't suffice our farmers. It's not enough. Uh, that's why we depend on other countries. Now, don't get me wrong. There's possibly a way for us to resolve that issue, but I don't think the powers that be care too much about that, uh, at least the current powers that are in Washington at the moment and the current administration. Anyways, then you got India, and then you got Russia. Uh, I want to draw your attention to India as well real quick. Uh, in the last Sunday Shift Report, I showed you that India is working out deals with Russia in regards for uh, currency to kind of get their uh, – to get fuel 
and oil and whatnot to the country. Uh, so they're working with their credit systems and stuff like that. Basically a work around the SWIFT system. Uh, so that's what India is doing currently right now. And again, not the Indian people, the Indian government. I like to state that up front. I'm never talking about the people, folks. I'm only, only talking about the governments. Uh, the people are always the uh, the people that suffer. You know what I mean? Uh, just like in Ukraine, uh, the Ukrainians are suffering uh, versus the political parties, let's say Russia uh, with Putin. Uh, it's not the Russian people. It's Putin and his army uh, and his uh, political realm of things uh, and so on and so forth. And the people that run these 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 countries exacerbate the situation. Matter of fact, it made me think of something. and I'm going to show you that here in a second. But anyways, that is the production volume of nitrogen fertilizer worldwide. I'm assuming uh, it hasn't changed much Uh in uh, the last couple of years, things usually take a long time for things to change and move around, just like when the United States was dependent on itself uh, just not too long ago. And look how fast that changed. But in general, if you look at the 50s, 60s, uh, when things were different, when we had a lot of manufacturing here in the United States versus uh, in the 70s and 80s when they started pushing it all overseas, basically to China uh, and why we're in the predicament that we're in now. Anyways, uh, so th that's that. I just wanted to show you that, that China is the big dog. Uh, in this game when it comes to uh, production of uh, some of the fertilizer as well as Russia. Now, Russia also, it's not just the nitrogen fertilizer. Uh, there's two types of fertilizers that our farmers use. Uh, and you guys who are farmers and, and uh, you know, gardeners and stuff like that know that there's different types of fertilizer. But both of them we heavily import in this country. But before we move on, I do want to bring up two things. People ask me all the time and uh, question me on my thoughts on, on, on the whole Ukraine thing. And uh, I, I want you guys to check out a video, okay? Uh, I don't know if you guys know who Mike Glover is. Mike Glover uh, has a channel, a uh, large channel, and he also runs Fieldcraft Survival. So what I want to do is I want to bring up uh, something real quick, and I want you guys to watch this video. Mike Glover uh, was a Special Forces Operations guy, uh, as well as the people he associates with in this video. Uh, he also did some work for the CIA. Uh, you, you'd have to look into his own thing. I don't want to misquote his... Uh, his accolades and things that he's done in his life, but just watch this video. So I'm going to bring his channel up there and, uh, right there. I'm going to kind of highlight the one that I want you to check out. Uh, and it says, uh, Ukraine footage with Mike Glover and the CBRS group. Uh, all these guys are, uh, veterans, uh, of our, uh, of our military and the special operations and whatnot. And also, uh, you know, we're deployed in Iraq, uh, deployed in Afghanistan, as well as other places that they probably cannot talk about. But I want you to listen to their discussion. It's only, I forget, it's an 11, 11 and a half, 12 minute video. Listen to their discussion on what they think is going to happen in Ukraine, uh, as well as Putin and all the other uh, things that they have to say. So I, I really would, if you guys get a chance, and if you guys happen to leave a comment, let them know Gray sent you. Not that if it matters or not, but I like to, to let folks know that I do point people to their channels. Uh, regardless of their, their size or whatnot and stuff like that, uh, in case they get a massive uh, influx of questions, you know what I mean, and they want to know why. Anyways, check Mike Glover out and check that video out. I think it's the third one that he just had, uh, but a good channel. Uh, very interesting thing, teach a lot of combat techniques and stuff like that, but that one video I want you guys to check out. Anyways, <coughs> excuse me. Another thing I want you guys to check out uh, before we continue with the Sunday Shift Report, there is a documentary by Oliver Stone. Some people say it's propaganda, uh, you know, but everybody's watched Oliver Stone's movies, documentaries, and everything that Oliver Stone has done uh, over the past decades and decades, right? Um, people have tried to put this on the platform. Uh, I I had to find, I had to actually rent it from uh, from one of my uh, streaming sites to watch it because someone had brought it to my attention and I wanted to check it out. Um, but it, it's a very interesting uh, documentary. Uh, this is what it's called. Some of you guys may even know, um, have seen it, for all I know. You know what I mean? Uh, but it was brought to my attention. I don't know. You know, as with anything, anything that you watch or read and stuff like that, even myself, you know, take it with a grain of salt. Do a little further research in it. But it's called uh, it's called Ukraine on Fire. And uh, there's a lot of things I didn't know. And when I watched this, I was just kind of like shocked. Shocked to say the least. So if you guys get a chance, uh, check out that documentary about Oliver Stone. If you can find it, you can just type in the title there, Oliver Stone Documentary in 2016. Uh, but quite, quite intriguing. Didn't even know it existed until just a few days ago, surprisingly. 
Anyways, back on topic. Uh, so what did we hit? We hit the fertilizer, right? So letting this kind of look. Let's look at the uh, world's six biggest corn producers. You know what I mean? And uh, let's bring that up. All right, so uh, I'm only going to look at the top two here. You know what I mean? Uh, just because I wanted to specifically show these two. Uh, but it says United States uh, is number one in the world's uh, biggest corn producers, right? Uh, and number two is China. <clears throat> I just wanted to know that China is right behind the United States. Now, here's the reason I wanted to focus this is because half of our grain uh, or our corn that we grow, and if you look into this article here, um, it says uh, more corn is produced than any other grain crop uh, for a good reason. It's a staple for food for many people and major component of livestock feed. Corn is used as high fructose sweetener in many processed foods, and it's the main ingredient in corn oil, corn starch, and corn syrup. Uh, it also says corn can be used to create ethanol fuel, uh, and uh, even the cobs have industrial uses for their absorbent uh, qualities. Anyways, corn is grown as a cr uh, cash crop. I don't know why I'm trying to slur my words here. Maybe I'm just uh, too much coffee. I don't know. Anyways, this is a production data from 2019 to 2020. The U.S. Uh, is the largest producer and exporter of corn with production in 2019-2020 season pegged at 346 million metric tons. Now, Domestic consumption was a large percentage of the total, and approximately half of that was used to feed grain for livestock. So we cut that 346 million, which is 170 million metric tons roughly for us, the American people. When you break that down to our population and everything else corn is used for, it's not much. So again, we import grain and corn from other countries, being places like China. And you'll see why I'm trying to get to, uh, to the, what, what all this is going to roll into. Anyways, uh... China is the second largest at 260.8 metric tons of corn. Moving on from that, let's look at uh, wheat. Wheat distributors. Let me put this up real quick. Twenty. Uh, this is the top 20 largest wheat exporters in the world. Again, these are world numbers, folks. Anyways, guess who's number one? Russia. Russia produces 23.92% of the world's wheat exports. <clears throat> Coming in at number two, Canada. And then third, ironically, is the United States. Uh, so basically, you got to take the United States and Canada together, basically, to come close to what Russia is exporting. But also, I want you to look at number five, the Ukraine. The Ukraine is almost at 9% as a producer of the world's exporters in wheat. Also, uh, Kazakhstan... Uh, there's a couple other places in here that I wanted you to look at, Pakistan, and a few others. Uh, but mainly, number one is Russia, and then we have Canada and the United States. Now, some of these numbers, uh, you have to understand, with the health crisis, supply chain, and everything else that's all just being so so heavily disrupted, uh, this is why we are dealing with some of the food crisis and things that we're seeing in this country, uh, as well as globally. You know, I don't want to, you know... Uh, not say it's not happening to the entire world population. But anyways, I, I, I just keep on wanting to show you that Russia and China keep on popping up at the top of these charts. All right, so let's move on to this. Now, people might not understand why I'm going to bring this one up. Uh, this one is oil producers, largest oil producers in the world. And uh, the reason I bring it up is oil uh, which you know, is used to produce stuff like gas and diesel and stuff like that. It's processed into many, many different things, right? Um, well, like I said before, our farmers' tractors, our trucks that deliver stuff, uh, the planes, the trains, everything. Everything you can think of runs on fuel. So that when the cost of fuel and oil go up, uh, that cost, of course, incurs on us, we the people. Anyways, let's look at this chart here. Uh, this chart is also based out of 2018, so I'm assuming some of this is because they have the United States as number one. Well, in 2018, remember who was president at that point. Think of 2021 or moving into 2021, 2022. Think about who the president is now. So I'm assuming the United States is probably, I don't know, they might still be up there somewhere, but uh, I don't think uh, we're producing what we should be producing, right? Uh, and we've talked about this as well. Anyways... Coming in at an, uh, a number two, a close number one, if they're not number one at this point, is Russia, folks. Is Russia. Do you see the common thread here? Russia and China are the common thread. 
with this thing. Why do we depend on wheat, corn, oil, and so many other products from other countries? Uh, that's why I feel no matter if you didn't like the guy or, or whatever that whatever reason some people might not have liked the previous president, he had some great policies in regards to energy and self-sufficiency for us in the United States. Anyways, I'll digress there. Anyways, Russia is at number two. Number three is Saudi Arabia. I don't know if you guys, in my last article, I showed you what Saudi Arabia is doing. Saudi Arabia has decided to take, and, and I did mis, misspeak. Uh, I, I, I think I, I picked this up on Thursday on the live stream. But anyways, Thursday, uh, or I had misspoke. The yen is Japanese. The yuan is Chinese. So Saudi Arabia has decided to start accepting the yuan uh, for oil, just imagine if they told the world, well, for now, we're only going to accept the Juan. I'm not saying that's going to happen like right now, right away, but Saudi Arabia is working on taking the Chinese Juan for oil. So that, of course, is going to affect our dollar. Uh, the American reserve, as they call it, the reserve currency of the world, the U.S. dollar, uh, which is slipping, folks, slipping. And, and I'm going to show you something with the banks here real quick. But anyways, moving on to number four, Iraq. Uh, Iraq to me is still unstable. Have you guys have seen some of the things that have happened in Iraq as of late, just as like Afghanistan and all the other places like that? Anyways, then we got coming at number five, Canada, and of course, number six, China. So China's still on the board for oil as well. The United Emirates States, the UAE, we've seen uh, what they've done. They've basically told Corn Pop, uh, we're not going to do this. We don't want to take your phone calls. We don't care. We don't care. So just Pay attention to stuff. And even at number 10, Iran. Iran down there at the bottom of number 10. So you have Iran, United Emirates, China, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, and Russia. They're on the top 10 of oil producers in the world. Uh, and I don't want to take anything away from our guys here in the U.S. Uh, but their hands are tied, folks. Their hands are tied. They have this misconception that they're trying to blame the entire our economy issues, our oil issues, our fuel prices, they're trying to blame it on, what do they call it? They call it the Putin price hikes, which is trending, which is trending. But if you're smart enough, you folks have seen inflation, fuel costs, and everything skyrocketing prior to this conflict overseas. Sure, it has exacerbated the situation a little bit more, and I feel it's only going to get worse um, as we start doing more of these sanctions. And then if we push in on the Chinese, uh, I wonder how far this administration is willing to go. Now, the Chinese, I looked at the Chinese television, which is hard to find Chinese news sometimes. It's hard to find, you know, they, they had this two-hour conversation. Corn Pop and Z had this conversation for two hours, and very little came out of it. Um, everything that I can read and transcripts and stuff like that. And Xi basically still said, Taiwan belongs to us. Taiwan belongs to us. And here's a huge thing with Taiwan. I think they produce roughly 80% of the chip manufacturing in the world. Like they, they produce a large volume. The 80%, maybe I'm off. But they produce a large... Sorry, I thought I had something on my mouth. Anyways. <clears throat> They produce a large portion of the chip manufacturing in Taiwan. Just imagine once that, if, if that, and most likely it could be uh, here in the near future under Chinese control, chips run everything. What do I mean? Your your cars, your computers, uh, anything digital. You know, people, when they think chips, first thing they think is computers, but it goes beyond that. Because think of what's what computers are inside, your phones, and the list goes on, right? So think about that amount of power being wielded by one country let's say like China. Uh, and this is just touching on, this is just, I'm just touching on some things. Just imagine lithium, the lithium that goes into all these smart cars and, or whatever, electric cars and stuff like that. The lithium that's in Afghanistan, the lithium that's in Russia, the lithium, the lithium that's in the Ukraine and all these other places <clears throat> that are basically somewhat in conflict at this point. Hopefully you guys are, are understanding what I'm trying to show you here in this video, <clears throat> because this is going to affect us here at home, no matter how we look at things, folks. No matter how we look at things. All right. And I wanted to, you know, one crazy thing. I, you know, I'm looking at this. Every time we see something in the news, does it make you, like, ever question, how did this happen? And then the news will come out and say, well, this happened because of a faulty wiring or this something like that. But did you guys see 
that massive fire, as you can tell by the thumbnail, I'm aware, and I'm assuming all you folks are aware, that massive fire uh, at the Walmart uh, the Walmart uh, distribution center. Did you see that massive thing? I have a small clip I'll throw up here real quick for you folks uh, on the screen here. And uh, you can see it here. Massive. Huge. Level the place, folks. Freaking level the place. Anyways, uh, I'm assuming most of you guys have seen that footage, but that was a massive fire. Um, I forget what they're blaming it on now. Uh, you know, they're going to blame it on something. That's how it always uh, goes. And uh, one other thing before we get into a uh, real thing, that before I touch on the banks and what they're doing in, in China and Belarus and a few other things uh, in North Korea, we got a few other things to, <laughs> to, to bring up. Anyways, I want to show you this article real quick for us folks in the prepping community. Um, this, a lot of us, uh, will stockpile in our prepper pantries, canned goods. You guys have seen a lot of prepper hauls with canned goods and canned foods here in this article, which is linked down below. Uh, it says there will likely be a canned food shortage in 2022 high prices and low availability of aluminum may cause canned food and beverage shortages this year, much like the end of 2021. This extends not just to canned food, but also canned pet food. A lot of people have brought that in the community and been asking, Hey, there's a lot of pet food shortages out there. Some people are getting creative, you know, with their gardens. And that's what is great about the preparedness community is a lot of us have fallback plans. Uh, and that's how we have to think. Okay, if I can't get fertilizer, well, I can do composting. I can do this. I can do that uh, to substantiate from not having to use uh, to purchase fertilizer at its cost or the shortages or whatnot. You know, because, of course, it's, it's getting pricier. Uh, they're finding you're finding places where you go where there's a limit of how many uh, bags of fertilizer you can buy. So think about people with chickens and stuff like that. They can re they can use some of that stuff. People with rabbits and and the list goes on. Um, but David the Good had did make a good uh, thing is when you buy fertilizer from let's say other farmers, who knows what they have used uh, and the feed that the feed that they grew for their animals if they use some sort of herbicides or pesticides and whatnot that the cows consumed, then it's excreted in their bile. Uh, at bile, yeah, their their poop, basically, which is you're using in your garden, and which can create some issues. And I'm some some folks out there have had that issue. Anyways, went a little bit off off topic here, but anyways, it says we may see shortages of imported goods as well. Imported foods like cheese, boba, and other foreign product produced items may be in short supply due to availability, supply chain issues, and higher costs to transport goods overseas. So basically, you know, the tanker ships uh, they run on fuel. Uh, they don't run on solar power. They don't run on batteries. They don't run on wind power or none of that crap like that. They run on fuel. Uh, fuel costs are still going up. And uh, if you watch the price of oil, and I've already discussed why oil, why we've seen a little bit of alleviation at the pump, but don't get complicit in the fact that you see this little bit of a, a little bit of a drop in the fuel prices, uh, because most uh, economists are looking at the future come summertime and stuff like that that fuel costs are going to continue to rise. Uh, so it, while it, if you feel like it's cheap enough for you to buy a little bit of extra and keep that in your reserves and add a little stable to it so you can have some extra gasoline. I mean, the gasoline that I got stored, I, I think I paid, like I said, under two bucks for it. Uh, so to me, I feel I, I'm up. It's like playing the stock market in a certain a sense. You know what I mean? The fuel that I got is worth twice what I paid for, it, which is awesome in my book. Anyways, again, likely canned food shortage in 2022. So Keep an eye out. If you can't, stock up. Prep up. Do what you can to get these things that you may need. Sure up any holes that you may have. You know, shoot for, you know, if you, if you I know people are, the finances are getting tight, folks. Um, but if you can, look for the buy one, get ones. Look for deals. Uh, check different stores. You know, go if you want to go to Aldi's, Costco, BJ, Sam's, uh, Walmart, wherever you can find these deals at, shop around. Find the best deals. Find the best bang for the buck. Because even in this industry, they're shorting you. You used to be able to buy a 16-ounce can, 16 ounce can of beans for, let's say, $2. Now you're getting a 12-ounce can of beans for $3. So stay aware. Stay focused. Stay, watch the information. Pay attention to what's going on so that you don't – so that every dollar that you put into your food storage uh, can go as long as it can go, Okay. Uh, just just some advice, I guess, from my perspective. Um, all right. And then real quick, uh, I want to show you something with the banks. The banks, you know, a lot of us talk about precious metals, but even the banks now uh, are starting to, uh, to diverge into gold. If you look at this chart right here, right, look 
at <laughs> the banks are starting to stock more gold. And that makes you question, why are they doing it? They usually just are, are, are inundated with fiat currency. But if you look at these charts here, and, uh, and you can see since March, uh, banks are stocking up heavily on gold. Uh, so that should be an inclination to you if banks are in investing into precious metals. Or getting more involved in that whole thing, uh, something is up and something is coming down the pipe. So be forewarned in regards to uh, what might be transpiring. But I just wanted to show you that that how all of a sudden banks are just starting to uh, stockpile gold itself. Uh, so it just makes you question. I'm gonna I'm digging more into it. I just haven't had the information I'm looking for yet, uh, and uh, trying to figure out what's the uh, game plan and why they're doing what they're doing. I have a friend of mine that works in the banking system, and I'm waiting to hear back from them. All right. So one thing I want to bring up uh, real quick is, uh, are you f folks familiar with what they call a proxy war? I don't know if you ever heard that term, a proxy war. I'll bring up the definition of a proxy war so that you can see it. Uh, basically, it says it's a war instigated by a major power which does not itself become involved. Uh, the end of the Cold War brought to an end to many of the proxy wars, though which the two sides struggled to exert their influence. Anyways... It's basically saying a superpower gets involved into a conflict without physically getting involved, like sending countries MIGs, arms, drones, and so on and so forth. Some people would consider, even if a country is in a proxy war, that they're involved in war, and some countries may look at it as involvement and then draw that country into an actual full-fledged real war, a.k.a. World War World War Three. Um because that's what we're engaged in here in the U.S. We are in a proxy war. Uh, and you've seen, we've done this in the past uh, with Afg when Russia invaded Afghanistan. Uh, we've seen it when we in Vietnam. We've seen it in a lot of different places, how countries like to play the whole proxy war. Uh, you know, we're not going to put boots on the ground, but we're going to supply the, uh, the other side or whatever side that these countries are supplying, just like Russia supplied uh, the Viet Cong with weapons and stuff like that. And uh, luckily... A lot of it hasn't escalated into a full-fledged war, but the way things are moving around right now are quite intriguing, and that's why I want you guys to watch that video by Mike Glover and his uh, group of guys, because these guys are special operations, so they've seen things that your average uh, you know, soldier hasn't. They've been involved in things that your average soldier hasn't. They have first-hand account for what they expect to see and what may happen uh, with this whole crisis in the Ukraine uh, and what's going on down there. Um, and then speaking of that, you know, I don't know if you guys saw uh, Russia is trying to flex its muscle uh, down over there uh, in the Japan, uh, by Japan by uh, running some ships down there, I think it was. Let me bring it up for you real quick. It says uh, Russia flexes muscles near Japan and show of two front capability. And see, the thing that we keep on hearing in American news is Putin is weak, his army is weak. Uh, we keep on hearing all this stuff about how weak they are, how they're being slaughtered, uh, they're at a standstill, and all this stuff like that, right? Now, is it propaganda? I don't know. I'm not on the front lines, folks. I can't be 100% and say with absolute certainty that, that, that you know, that, 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 that maybe that is happening. Maybe it is. Uh, but again, that's why when I listened to Mike and his group of guys, I was kind of like, okay, I can see the uh, the experience and the information they had way better information than I could ever give you on a perspective of what's going on over there. Anyways, back to this whole thing. It says even as uh, even as much of Russia's military is tied up in the invasion of Ukraine, Moscow is demonstrating that it can still operate in the Far East with shows of force in Japan's neighborhood. Four Russian tank landing ships were observed passing through the Tsunguru Strait between Hanushu and Hokkaido. On Tuesday and Wednesday, traveling westward to the sea, uh, into the Sea of Japan, according to Japan's defense ministry. Um, and then when it comes to my question, here, th this is the way my mind thinks, okay? My mind's thinking, okay, if Russia is stalling out and, and, and Putin's army is, is getting their butts handed to him and, and, and everything else like that, in my eyes, I'm wondering, okay, so why is it NATO? Why is NATO and all of its, you know, counterparts, the Americans... And everybody else, everybody that's involved in NATO, um, if 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 uh, the Russian military is not what they expect it to be, uh, and they're you know they're just a pushover per se, right? And I'm not saying that's what, I'm not saying by far I'm not saying that's what's happening or or what is. I'm just speculating. Is uh, then 
why don't they just go ahead and say, okay, here's the MiGs, here's this, let's move in, uh, you know, let's send our troops in, let's send some, you know, German troops in, some Polish troops in, some U uh, UK troops in, some United States troops in, and push them back, and push the Russians back, right? Uh, and I get the, the repercussions from that, uh, but, you know, I just, I hear all this stuff, and I'm thinking, okay, well, if that's the case, and, and then the first thing that pops up is nuclear, you know, the, the nuclear threat uh, is why a lot of countries won't do it. Uh, I had a conversation with a gentleman at my shop, and he swore up and down that he knew that, well, you know, Russia's capab nuclear capability is not what it is. Uh, most of their stuff is, you know, old and this and this and that. And I'm thinking, man, I'm not sure where he's getting his information at, but all the statistics and everything that I've read and learned and people that I've spoke to said Russia has a massive nuclear capability. Anyways, I'm just trying to figure out, you know, what's going on in, in, that, in that aspect. It's like why... Our kind of are you know the propaganda machine in the U.S., other countries, Russia's propaganda. Everybody, it's just a an onslaught of misinformation. Uh, it's crazy, and that's why I like the Discord, folks. If you're not part of that, we have that one section in the Ukraine because you'll see a lot of conflicting information popping in through there, which is quite intriguing to see it, but it can be quite confusing to say the least. Uh, speaking of, uh, you know, over there in the Indo Pacific, uh, North Korea is at it again. It says, North Korea fires four projectiles into the sea, uh, South Korea on alert. Uh, in this latest move that could ramp up tensions on the Korean Peninsula, North Korea on Sunday morning fired four projectiles into the Yellow Sea, South Korean military officials said. The four shots were fired from an unspecified location in western North Korea and fell into the sea off the nation's west coast during a span of an hour around 7.20 a.m. local time, according to officials reported by the Yonhap News Agency. There were shots believed to be that North Korea's multiple rocket launchers this morning, an official from the South Korean military said at an emergency meeting, adding that the South Korean force is maintaining defense readiness, posture, and while closely monitoring their developments. So since January, the North Koreans uh, have uh, stepped up their missile testing and whatnot as well. And I thought that was quite interesting to say the least. Why did that pop back up? Sorry. As I'm moving stuff around on my desk or my screens here, things are just doing some weird stuff. Um, where else did I want to go uh, on this? Speaking of which, you guys have probably heard that Russia made a statement saying that they were using hypersonic missiles uh, down in um, down in the Ukraine conflict that they're going through right now. Um, I do have a small clip. Uh, I'm not. I'm going to mute the clip because it's loud. Uh, but our yeah, I'm going to mute it just because last time that I don't know what happened. Anyways, let me throw it up on the screen for you real quick. <coughs> but that was a, a video from a, a Ukrainian uh, person that uh, that had uh, shot that video of that hypersonic missile. Uh, and the missiles, I think they're called the KH-47M2 uh, hypersonic missiles. Uh, some people say that it's just uh, propaganda, but this video shows... Uh, it in action, uh, and not coming from a Russian media source, this is coming from a Ukrainian media, media source. Um, and there's one thing that I'm going to say at the end that's kind of bothering me about the U.S. Army that just popped up uh, as I was getting ready to put this up. Now, also, uh, Zelensky has made some claims that other uh, other countries, uh, he, he's, he's, he said that the Belarusians are, are going to maybe getting involved into this uh, war uh, down in Ukraine. So let me throw it up real quick. It says Ukraine sees signs of another neighbor in, uh, planning direct invasions. It says Ukraine's Ministry of Defense on Sunday claimed that the Belarus is preparing its military to invade Ukraine before warning Belarusian President Alexander Lushensko, an ally of Russian President Vladimir Putin. There are signs of preparation that Belarus will carry out direct invasion of the territory of Ukraine. The defense ministry wrote on social media, according to translation, it did not provide evidence for its claim, nor did it provide other details. Again, with the propaganda, a lot of different information out there. Uh, it's just, it, it, it gets so overwhelming sometimes, you're just trying to figure out fact from fiction. Anyways, it says the direct involvement of Belarusian troops uh, in Russia's armed aggression against Ukraine against the will of ordinary soldiers and the vast majority of the Belarusian people will be a fatal mistake for Alexander Lushkino. Lush, Lushkino. Uh, hopefully I said his name right. Anyways, the ministry added, officials in Belarus have not issued a public comment in response to the Ukraine's allegations. I guess only time will tell if the Belarusians actually get involved. Uh, who knows? They may. And like I said, other countries are by proxy are being involved. 
Um, and uh, of course, you guys have heard the whole uh, Chechen soldiers, uh, th those folks that are getting involved. There's a lot of interesting things. Uh, Zelensky's asked Israel, why aren't you giving us, uh, helping us out? Uh, Israel says it has its reasons. Iran is... And then, man, when you look at stuff, how is Putin brokering the deal for Iran? Uh, <laughs> it, it, just, it just besieges me and like, the country has just gone mad. Like the previous video that I did, the world's gone mad. It just, every time you turn around. Anyways, real quick, I want to bring this whole thing about China, what's going on, uh, you know, back to our, our food thing. Because it made me, I forgot I had this article kind of sitting there. Um, I told you guys, over 51 million people are locked down and, and uh, that we discussed prior. And uh, it's getting rough out there in China, which is going to affect the supply chain because we import so much goods from China. Anyways, to the article. It says, just as the Russian-Ukraine war affects the world's food and energy supply chain, their supply, China's zero Charlie Victor policy under under the raging, uh, the big O variant further threatens the global supply chain. I got to watch what I say sometimes. Anyways, Chinese officials announced that on March 15th, the big O has spread to 28 provinces in China and at least 385 cities have reported confirmed cases. Consequently, many cities are uh, locked down or semi-closed to comply with the zero Charlie Victor policy. Uh... Dongguan, an important, industri uh, an important industrial city in the Pearl River Delta uh, in the coastal province of the Guangdong, adopted a seven-day lockdown on March 14th. Factories, uh, factories, enterprises, industrial parks are restricted from business activities and cargo transport. Public transportation is suspended, non-essential traffic is banned, and unnecessary traveling out of the city is forbidden. Anyways, it said a, a Dongguan uh, textile company uh, owner, Mr. Wang, told the uh, Epoch Times that the lockdowns have caused the complete disruption of the production logistics, even as express delivery is halted, it's, inter it's all interrupted, he said. So basically everything is just shut down. He says, we can only try uh, not to take orders and wait for the uh, epidemic to subside, said Mr. Peng, owner of a hardware and mold accessories company in the Dongan region. And I'm probably saying that wrong, but, you know, that's just my pronunciation, and I'm always pronouncing things wrong. Again, this whole thing in China... With their country locking down, will affect not not just the U.S. It'll affect the global supply chain because they're a major producer of so much. They export. They're a major exporter, just like Russia is a major exporter. A lot of other countries, some of these superpowers, are major exporters. And unfortunately, here in America, we are a major importer at this point. Anyways, I don't even want to go down that, that rabbit hole. Not even a rabbit hole. It's just a uh, it, it, it irate. It, it gets me a little agitated, folks. Anyways, uh, one thing that I, was brought to my attention, and I got an email about it, so I looked it up, is our military. You know what I mean? I want to show you something that's going on in our military, uh, because here in the U.S., they're not really talking too much about Charlie Victor other than Fauci coming on the scene and said, hey, you know, by Easter, uh, you might see things coming back to the way it was a year ago. Uh, and that's the last thing that us as Americans want to hear. Uh, I don't think... That the administration, I don't know, I'm very curious how the administration is going to deal with it uh, because it hasn't gone away. People are still dying. People are still getting infected. People are still, things are still happening around. Um, a lot of things are, are transpiring that we're just not being made aware of it. You know what I mean? Anyways, let me throw this last article up because this pissed me off. Anyways, it says U.S. Army announces first separations over Charlie Victor uh, refusals. The U.S. Army last week announced the separations of three soldiers who refused to take the Charlie Victor uh, the first time it has discharged troops over the mandate. The Army also said that, uh, that so far it's relieved six regular Army leaders, so not just whole soldiers, leaders in the regular Army. Uh, two of them who were battalion commanders. It also issued 3,251 reprimands for soldiers who refused the victor, according to a March 18th statement. Anyway, as the army accesses the discharge, uh, as the army accesses the discharges, soldiers and continues to refine data tracking process, the victor percentages will vary slightly. The army said in a statement, uh, the Epoch Times has contacted army for comment, which they have not got a respond from those folks yet. So yes, do you see this in mainstream news? Are you guys reading this in CNN, NBC, ABC, CBS, even on Fox? Are you, are you have you guys seen this? Uh, I don't know. Maybe it'll be there next week. Uh, who knows, but so things are still happening, folks, behind the scenes. It's just they're so focused on 24-7 coverage of what's going on overseas that these things are going unnoticed. 
Um, have you guys noticed the violent uptick? Uh, look, th this blew me away when I, when I saw this. Houston, 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 Texas, folks. Houston, Texas has more murders and more violent crime than Chicago, L.A., Philadelphia, New York. Houston has taken the, the helm at the most violent. Even the, uh, what is it, the... Uh, what is it? The president of the uh, police association there said he's afraid of his family to go out because the violent crimes have gotten so worse. People say, well, why is this happening, Gray? Well, the way they went into detail about this is that the southern border is an influx of Mexican gangs and all different types of people that are coming in and settling into these spots. I even watched a video that blew my mind away that this police officer went to go serve a warrant, basically, and was met with automatic gunfire. Uh, like he was in a war zone. He was armed with a Glock. And this gentleman behind the door was armed with an automatic firearm. And started shooting at this officer. Um, I only saw clips of the video. So I don't know to the full extent. And I'm not going to make a comment on that. But that was down there in Texas. So the southern border. We don't hear that too much in the news. We don't see this massive influx. And then here... Uh, I don't know if the current administration is going to reinstate it or not, uh, but number 45's uh, order to, uh, in order to stay uh, for people uh, because of the whole Charlie Victor situation uh, expires. And there's over, I think they said, over 170,000 people uh, waiting to cross the border as soon as this thing is lifted, which is, I think is this month. Um, I will find out more information about that and share that with you as I become uh, informed on it. Maybe you guys have already informed on it. I don't know if someone's already covered that on YouTube. But anyways, a lot of things are happening. But the main thing is, folks, what I want you to focus on is the food situation, the food and energy sectors of the United States. To me, that's the most critical component of this whole situation. The fertilizer, the wheat, the corn, all that. Like I said in the beginning, look at what I showed you. Look who the major producers are. You got China, Russia, Ukraine, and a few other countries that are not super friendly with the West or the United States and other countries. When I say the West, you guys know the West and East and all that. Hopefully you guys figured that out. Uh, I, I figure most of you guys know because that's what they call us. In China and in Russia, they say the West. Uh, but anyways, uh, this has gone on long enough. I want to say thank you to all the folks that, you, uh, that joined me on this premiere. Truly appreciate that. Hopefully you got some value out of this. If you can hit the thumbs up button, that's always appreciated as well. Um, I got a few videos planned for this week. I look forward to that. I go live on Tuesday. And I go live on Thursday. Now, I may have a guest on Tuesday. And if I do, it's going to be an early live stream. i got to confirm with him uh, on Tuesday. It might be a, a noon, 12 noon. So stay on the lookout for that. As soon as I, I will, maybe I'll do a small two-minute video, one-minute video letting you know that the live stream will be at noon versus 7 p.m. But I, I'm not 100% sure yet. Uh, I just need to verify that. And I'll let you guys know. Uh, it just do because of their time zones. Uh, they're overseas. And the time zone only works well if he comes on at 12. Anyways, I'll get more into that. Other than that, thank you all. Thank you so much. Uh, truly, uh, God bless everyone out there. Stay safe, please. Stay prepped. Keep on prepping. Do whatever you can uh, to ensure the safety uh, of your family. You know what I mean? Other than that, this is Gray Man. I'm out. See you guys in the rebound. Stay safe. <laughs>